Hey everyone, thanks for joining Baltimore County Fire Department EMS Academy. For those who I haven't met, my name is Sean Barinholtz. I am an anesthesia and ICU physician at Hopkins. I am an active member of Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company in Baltimore County, and I have the honor of serving as one of the associate medical director in uh, the medical director's office for Baltimore County Fire Department. On behalf of Dr. Andy Pollack in the medical director's office, on behalf of the EMS office, Chief Shenning, Captain Stewart, Captain Fitzpatrick, thank you so much for what you guys do every day. Thank you for your dedication for lifelong learning and thanks for being with us here tonight. Uh, big shout out to Ashley McClure. Ashley is a volunteer at Pikesville. She's running our uh, live stream here. Uh, Ashley's also the one who's gonna put a link in the chat at some point during this training. You click on the link, fill out a quick form and you can get your MIM CEUs. So if you wanna get your MIM CEUs, uh, we'll announce it, keep an eye out on the chat. Uh, click the link, enter a little bit of information, and we'll get you your MIMS CEUs. Uh, tonight, we have the pleasure and honor of hosting again uh, Deanna Bridge Najera. Deanna is a PA who splits her time between the emergency department at MedStar Montgomery Medical Center and the Carroll County Hospital or Health Department. At our previous emergency department employer, she was part of the team to revise the alcohol withdrawal protocol, as well as the reverse, the cycle ED based addiction intervention program. Uh, Deanna gave a great talk for us way back when, years ago, I think it's probably close to three years ago when we were still conducting this, I believe at Essex, perhaps a mm -hmm. community college. I remember seeing that video. So thank you so much for being with us and, sh and sharing your time uh, and your expertise. We are very, very grateful. Oh, thank you so much. And I want to echo thank you for all that you do. I mean, it takes a village. We're all in this together. Um, so I really appreciate you spending even more time um, and spending it with me or whenever you're watching this. Um, and hopefully it can be of some use. So we're going to kind of tiptoe through the tulips of mental health emergencies and talking about kind of that aspect of pre-hospital care, um, reviewing some of the MEMS protocols, but also some best practices that are followed nationally. Um, so again, thank you so much for having me and feel free if you have questions to type them into the chat. Um, I'm also more than happy to answer questions afterwards or if you wanna shoot me an email too, it's, it's all fair game. So why should you care? Well, the national guidelines say you should, um, and then clinical practice guidelines say you should, but also what you do is dangerous. Um, why else are there video series and trainings for how to escape violent encounters? And, you know, unfortunately in the news all the time about pre-hospital personnel being involved in, in violent kind of interactions. So, you know, we need to be mindful of that. We need to be careful for that. We need to develop our skill set around that. So managing the agitated person, you know, we think of the field, but it can be in the station house, depending on what football team you cheer for. It can be in the emergency department when you're dropping off a patient, now it can be in the hospital setting, and it can even be in your kitchen. Um, so, you know, these are skills that can be applied in a lot of different areas. Um, so it's something to sort of put in your pocket and learn from. And the first couple of times that you start using some of these skills, it's going to feel awkward. Um, it just doesn't fit. It seems scripted. And the more you do it, you'll develop your own sort of flavor and way of doing this. And there's already individuals in your, probably in your station house that are kind of like the drunk whispers. You know who they are. That doesn't matter what scene they walk into. They just kind of sweet talk. And suddenly the guy is walking into the back of the ambo, no questions asked. So kind of watch how they interact with them. What are the words that they do? What is their body language and get feedback? You know, this is, it's in some ways acting, but it's also just sort of taking ownership of, of your own interactions with individuals to, to make it a better outcome for everybody. So we're gonna refer a lot to what's called Project Beta. So that's the best practices in the evaluation and treatment of agitation. So this was formed by um, papers put out by the American Academy of Emergency Psychiatry. And the AAEP is an interesting organization. They are partners with team psychiatrists and emergency medicine, um, both ED and pre-hospital personnel. And the idea being that there is a significant overlap between those um, environments and we need to do better talking to one another. So they put them out um, and they picked the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine on purpose because it's free and open access access, meaning you can Google it and get the articles for free without paying anything. But I will say it's hospital or, or facility-based best practice. So we can take some of these things and apply them to the pre-hospital setting, but not necessarily all of them. And just for reference, they do host an annual conference, National Updates of Behavioral Emergencies, which is really um, awesome conference to attend. It was virtual last year. It's still up in the air if it'll be virtual this year, um, but really great opportunities. 
So when we're talking about behavioral agitation, we want to sort of have a, a standard that we're comparing, you know, apples to apples and oranges to oranges. And one of the ways to do that is using a bars score. So that's basically saying how agitated is this individual or how sedated is this individual. So it ranges from one to seven, from difficult or unable to arouse all the way to violent requiring restraint. And we like people between three and five, you know, where they're redirectable or you kind of, you know, nudge them a little bit and they wake up, but you don't necessarily need to external rub them and you definitely don't need to be, you know, intubating. So we want them to be kind of communicative if we need them to be, but not agitated and trying to find that kind of sweet spot in our interactions. And really we want to be safer. Um, so this is an acronym that was developed for crisis intervention. It's used by EMS, police, but also like mobile crisis units. And they're sort of expanding that idea to the lay audience with um, the mental health first aid trainings. Um, and that's really becoming much more popular. In fact, the um, National Police Chief Organization has sort of set the bar that all police officers are going to be trained in mental health first aid. Um, just to again, improve those communication skills. Um, we recognize that what police and you guys are involved in, um, you don't always have the training for, um, you know, and if you're, if you're kind of given weapons and that's the only tool that you have, that's what you tend to go for. So we're hoping with talks like this and other trainings that are out there that you'll have more tools in your toolkit, um, which will make it less stressful in general. So we talk about safer, we're talking about stabilizing the situation and lowering the stimuli. So one of the big things is turning off the lights, turning off the sirens, you know, backing cars away so that there's more space and people don't feel boxed in. Assessing and acknowledging that this is a crisis. So don't walk up to somebody and be like, hey, man, what's going on? Acting like nothing's happening. Um, you can say, wow, this is pretty stressful. Like this escalated quickly um, because you're going to acknowledge the realness of the situation. And that's a way to partner with the person that you're talking to. And then facilitating identification and activation of resources. So you, especially if somebody's asking for somebody, you know, like, hey, where's my brother or my uncle or my aunt or my mom? Can, how can we help you find that person? You know, do you need me to call for you? Do you know their phone number? Is there somebody else that I can get? Or asking, um, you know, if there's another community member by like, hey, can you go grab this person or call them and let them know what's happening? Because again, a lot of times the stressors is just not knowing or not feeling like they have a way to tell family or friends what's happening for them. And encouraging the patient to use the resources and take actions in their best interest. Um, so this is just sort of saying like, hey, dude, we know what you got to do to get out of this situation. You know, like, let's just go with it. Let's make this happen. You know, obviously this is stressful where we're at. So let's go over to this corner and talk, or, you know, is there a way that we can help you feel like you have more ownership over this? And sometimes that does, you know, mean encouraging the person to start recording on their phone, um, as opposed to turning that into like a fight about things, because it makes them feel like they have um, documentation of the interactions. It makes them feel like they have control over a situation. Same thing if they want to make a phone call, let them make the phone call. You know, it's, it's, going to cost you more time, effort, and energy in the long run if you kind of fight them over the little things. And then recovery or referral. So this is, you know, the person that's refusing care. Um, how can we make sure that they're still in a safe situation? You know, we don't want to necessarily coerce people. Sometimes we have to. Um, but how can we make that the least stressful or at least, again, engaging those supports that, um, hey, you're going to have to come with us. I'm, I'm sorry that this is happening. But what can we do to help, you know, your kids get taken care of, your dog get taken home, whatever it is that's kind of stressing them the most about the situation. And the goals of psychiatric medication um, or management, you know, I, I like this picture because it's like, yeah, we can always straight jack people, um, but that's not really going to work because what do you do as soon as you feel closed in is you fight against it. So we want to stabilize the situation as quickly as possible. And we really want to always keep in mind what are the potential medical sources? What else could be going on for this individual at this time? And avoiding coercion. Now, coercion, you know, is more of when we talk about that is, is not necessarily forcing them to do something, but giving them the options, giving choices, and they might be two bad choices, you know, like, well, you can take a pill or you can take a shot. Um, you're still giving them medication, but you're letting them choose that and treating in the less, le least restrictive setting and forming alliances. Um, now that doesn't mean you go throwing the police officer under the bus, um, but you can be like, dude, this, this clearly is a sucky situation. How can we kind of make it better? Like, you know, let's, let's get in the back of the ambulance. Let's talk it out. Let's get away from the situation. Um, kind of let things calm down. And then the appropriate disposition is this somebody that legitimately has to have an emergency petition and go to the hospital or is it somebody that can be discharged community services? And then if you have the option, even what kind of hospital you're taking them to, if you have the ability to have access to a psychiatric emergency um, or mobile crisis, can we engage them and, and it doesn't tie up the emergency department? And then at the same time, um, is the right kind of individuals to be addressing this situation? So getting background, um, you know, on your arrival, obviously you're always trying to figure out 
you know, you get the call from dispatch that never matches what actually happens when you get on scene. And if there's four people, there's six different versions of what happened. So trying to, you know, check out what's happening and sometimes looking at their phones, you know, if you're saying, Hey, can you record what happened? Like, did he hit his head or did she, did you see her take something? Was there a car accident? What did you see when you got on there? Um, can be really educational. And obviously you're going to have a point person that's going to be talking to the patient and maybe your, your, your colleague is the one that's actually kind of getting out some additional supporting evidence for you. And then once they come to the emergency department, we're going to use the prescription drug monitoring program because in, in Maryland, the CRISP system, which is what is part of the PDMP, luckily has really expanded. So it's including discharge summaries, it's including lab results, other imaging, even just discharge diagnoses from inpatient stays. So it gives you a viewpoint of like, ah, okay, so this is something that I might be dealing with and need to pay attention to. We can always use their PCP or other care providers. Again, really helpful if they have some notes uploaded, but even if you see who prescribed them their last medication, then Google it real quick, try and see if there's somebody covering for that practice. And remember, you know, when we talk about privacy, it's an emergency situation and you can always receive information. You know, I can't confirm or deny, but if there's anything you'd like to tell me that could help me take care of this person, I'm all ears. Um, you know, can we get a phone number so that the ER provider can call you once we get there? Uh, that kind of stuff is invaluable to, to determining a disposition and, and kind of treatment interventions that might be necessary. And we always want to protect to assess protective versus risk factors for suicidal, homicidal, and violent ideation. So that's the S-I-H-I-N-V-I. And what that means is, is it's not just a blanket like, oh, if you have this, it's protective, or if you have this, it's a risk factor. Some things we know are risk factors. So having guns in the home. And remember, Maryland has the ability that if you want to, you can leave your guns with the police for a period of time and then get them back. No questions asked. There are also, though, some red flag rules, meaning if you're really worried about somebody, the police can actually take your guns for a period of time. Um, and then you have to petition to have them back. But then there's also the things like protective factors. So, you know, for some individuals, religion is a protective factor against suicide. Um, you know, they believe that they would burn in hell if they hurt themselves in some way. But for others, they believe that they're going to be, um, that God is going to forgive them for any wrongs that they have done. And that might actually be not a protective factor, but a risk factor based on their view of their religion. So you don't want to just say like, are you religious? Do you go to, you know, services? And then assume that that's a protective factor. You can actually go down that kind of rabbit hole and talk to them about, so how do you view your religion? How does your religion, is it supportive for you? Or is it something that actually might be shameful based on some things that happened to you in your personal life? So the patient's getting worse instead of better. What do we do? So the best example of verbal de-escalation. think about the things that you've tried, calm down, be reasonable. These are the rules. Do you want a pill or the shot? So kind of thinking like, hmm, how's this really gonna go? This is a great book, Verbal Judo. It's a book from the 90s. It's written by a police officer um, who gave trainings all across the US. Um, and he kind of started this conversation of utilizing the social work sort of skills in police interactions. And these are things he said to avoid, because if you think about it, what happens as soon as somebody tells you to calm down? So just think like the last time you interacted with a manager at a store or somebody gave you a little bit of attitude and said, hey, dude, calm down. And at least tell you to calm down, <laughs> you know, it like it puts you on the defensive. So the same thing about like, those are the rules. But the way that you were that is you're like, yeah, man, we all got to follow these stupid rules. That's partnering more with the patient than it is saying those are the rules and you have to follow them. It's like, we're in this together. Um, none of your business, you know, so somebody says, I want your name, I want your badge number, or I want this saying none of your business isn't going to get you anywhere. Say, sure, I'd be happy to give that to you. Do you want me to write it down or how should I get that? Well, I'm going to write it down as soon as we do this. Can you, you know, and just kind of delay them or direct them a little bit into getting to that point. And the same thing with the calm down is the why don't you be reasonable or what's your problem? I'm not going to say it again because you are going to say it again. Um, so this is, again, we're looking at like the two-year-old interactions and what things sort of work with them and don't work with them is the same when somebody's agitated or upset. So de-escalation. Now, these are steps from the Project Beta. So they're not my own, but they are amazing and try to incorporate them. Um, and again, it's about practicing and finding the sort of fit for you. What um, sort of cadence or saying sort of becomes something that you can practice and really incorporate into your interactions with patients or other individuals. So respecting personal space. Um, you know, Scene safety is the number one thing, um, but you also have to be mindful of, of making the person feel like they have an out. So we talk about like, if you're in a room situation, you don't wanna 
be, have the person between you and the door, but you also don't want to be the person between them and the door. You don't want to block their escape. So usually standing next to the door. So if they wanted to bolt, they could bolt, but you also have a way out too. And that is a, again, just a respectful way of, of knowing what's around you and what could be potentially a weapon or put you in harm's way. So not being provocative, being aware of your body language. Now there are sometimes cultural things such as um, you know how you're making eye contact or hand gestures and things like that. But in general, you know just being mindful if you feel yourself like arms crossed, is just kind of like, oh, that was a little chilly there, and just kind of slowly put your arms back down and just being mindful of, of the position that your body is in. And this is where again having a colleague or friend or family member say like, hey, have you ever noticed that you know how I stand or how I put my hands or cross my arms? Is it how does it come across? And keep in mind too, body size. You know, if, if you're a big person, you're going to be intimidating no matter who you are. So what do you have to do is you have to get low, you know, you have to squat, maybe lean against a wall. So you're at a little bit of a different angle. So it kind of de decreases the tension in the space. And then establishing verbal content, contact. And this is really good. You know, you come on scene, there's lots of people yelling and screaming. Um, and that stimulation is really revved up. So you really want to have a point person and say, hey, you know, my name's Deanna, this is Jim. I'm going to be the one talking to you. But if you need something, talk to, you know, we're here for you. So introduce everybody. So it doesn't seem like somebody's kind of lurking or spying. Um, but at the same time, only having that one point person. And the patient may be the one to pick who their point person is. This is again with that idea of the drunk whisper they kind of gravitate towards the person they feel is kind of most on their side. Um, but, and that's okay. So that's why everybody needs to sort of have their own skill set and way of doing that, because it may not be the role that you want, but it may be the role that you get. So being concise and repetition. And the reason this is important is because when you're super stressed out, it's extremely hard for you to process things. So using really long sentences is just not going to work. Saying things over and over is really important. Um, but at the same time, you, you got to watch about not turning into like a nagging or a preaching kind of quality is you really just want to to the point. So let me get this straight, you know, so I heard you say, uh, this is what we're going to do. So like I said, this is what we're going to do. You know, yep, you got some choices. This is a tough situation. Well, what are we going to do? Let's bring it back. What are we going to do? I heard you say that. And you just sort of repeat and circle back to that without kind of blowing them off. Um, and that helps them pay attention to what you're saying. And identifying wants and feelings. Um, you know, the persons may say like, they're going to rob a bank and be like, man, if I had a million dollars too, I hear you. What would you do with that? You know, just kind of just taking it and rolling with it. Um, but then also thought, you know, once and feelings like I want that cop arrested. I want this person fired. I want my landlord to, you know, leave me alone. Dude, I hear you. You know, what can we do to get towards that? Um, you know, can I get you the phone number for legal aid? Can I get you some community resources and say, well, you know, why don't we get in the back of the ambulance and, and we can look some things up for you and then we'll see what our next steps are. Um, just again, to sort of identifying what they're saying, what they want. Um, you don't have to agree with it, but you're just sort of saying, I hear you. And listening closely to what they're saying, summarizing is really key. Um, so I, I try to do this a lot and it's helpful too, just from a medical standpoint. Of, so just to make sure I got this straight. So 10 days ago, this happened. And then after that, that happened. And that then that happened. Am I, am I getting that right? Is that the right way that this happened? Okay, I just wanna make sure I have it straight. Um, you know, because, it, and people will say, wow, like you listened. It's like, yep, <laughs> you know, and it's not that you don't listen other times, but they're feeling legitimately heard. And then you have the issue though too of somebody that's hallucinating or delusional. And so to understand what another person is saying, you must assume that it's true and try to imagine what it could be true of. So you need to say the police are spying, the police are following around, the CIA is tapping my phone. You don't wanna say, dude, I got you. I totally know they're tapping my phone too. Cause they're going to see through that. They're going to, you know, they're going to know that you're not being truthful and saying, but you can agree with more like, oh, that sounds super stressful. Like I can't imagine how difficult that is because it is think how difficult that would be to think that you are being spied on all the time. So you can agree with them in the context of what you think that they're saying and then summarizing. So when did this start for you? What have you noticed? What have you been through? Um, and feeding that back so they can hear their story again. And then agree or agree to disagree. So you can agree with the truth. So that's like saying, yeah, I, my partner here has tried to stick you three times and here I am trying to stick you again for an IV. Like this is just the worst. Agreeing in principles. So, you know, saying like, 
you know, everyone sort of deserves respect. So you're not saying that they were disrespected. You're not saying that one thing happened or didn't happen, but you're saying with the principle of it and then agreeing with the odds, you know, anybody would be pissed about this situation. Um, you know, I can imagine just being really angry about having to wait this amount of time. Um, you know, you called 911 30 minutes ago and it took us this long to get here. The goal is really to agree as much as possible. And that's why like the movie, The Negotiator, you never say no. Um, you want to say, yeah, I, I hear that. So what else are we going to do about it? Instead of the, yeah, buts or the no, that's not going to happen. Um, you really want to kind of partner with them and sort of guide them to choosing the same thing you want them to do. But we do have to lay down the law, you know, and set limits, you know, like, hey, you know, you can yell and scream all you want, but spitting's not cool, you know, like, you know, please don't do that. You know, then we're gonna have to put a spit shield on you and stuff. And eh, I just don't want, it's a lot of paperwork, you know, like you're just kind of aligning again with them or, um, and setting the limits of like, you can do that, but you can't do this or redirect them. How about we do this instead? Um, you know, I see that you really don't want to sit on the stretcher. Do you need to walk a little bit and kind of, you know, pace, let them pace a little bit, but say, but you know, we got to stay here because there's traffic over there or because this is happening. So can we just walk in a circle, you know, between the cars or back and forth between the ambulance and the house or something like that? Like, I see that you need to, to walk a little bit so you can give them that room, but you're going to set limits about what they can and can't do. And you're offering choices. Um, you know, they must be realistic. You can't say, well, we're going to get you, we're going to take you to BWI and put you on a plane. Like they know that's not true. And it's also, then they're just going to get more mad when you don't do that. Um, you can offer medicine. You know, that is something that you're able to do is say like, it seems like, you know, things are really pretty stressful and you seem pretty, pretty upset. What do you think a medicine would help? You know, can I offer you something? What have you taken in the past? Um, you know, I only have the option of this and this. Is there one of those that you would prefer? Do you want to buy an IV or buy an injection? Would you like it in your arm or would you like it in your leg? You know, you're giving them lots and lots of options, even though in reality you're saying we're going to give you a medicine whether you like it or not. But it makes them it makes them engaged in the process of choosing. And then debriefing. So, you know, debriefing with the patient after you've restrained them, after you've medicated them, sometimes you don't have this opportunity. This is the opportunity for the emergency department or even the inpatient team to do of saying like, you know, I, things really got out of hand. And then you check a swung at one of our you know, staffers and we just, we really can't have that. It's just not safe. Um, and then saying, you know, and this is where, again, that sort of building forward is saying like, what kind of told you that what was it feeling that you were getting out of control? You know, what were those red flags for you that you were watching for? What did you notice? For you as pre-hospital personnel, it's really also about debriefing with staff. Like at what point was that tipping point where we're just not coming back from this? And sometimes it doesn't matter what you guys do. You know, you show up on the scene, you don't know how long that's been brewing before you got there, before you got the call. Um, so it may have ended up the same way anyway, but are there things that could have gone smoother? And this is where debriefing with other agencies will become important. Um, so keeping those open lines of communication and saying, you know, every time we show up with this officer on the scene, it's usually we're gonna have to administer medication you know, what else can we do? Um, but also just saying like, hey, when we got there and you guys yelled for us to give them medicine, it really set us at a, in a weird situation where we're either going against you or we're medicating a patient without an assessment. Like we need to have kind of a little bit more ground, a little bit more conversation. So some tips and tricks is just being genuine. You know, like I said, you don't want to say, oh, I see the pink elephant too. Um, but you can say like, wow, whatever you're seeing right now is, is really stressful for you um, or really funny for you. I really like to do matched pacing and mirroring. So, you know, you walk up and somebody's really loud and you get really loud too. You're like, oh my gosh, I know, I can't believe it. And then you're gonna voice drop. Um, so you're matching their agitation, you're matching their enthusiasm or their anger, but then you start to deescalate, you start to bring yourself down. And the interesting thing is because of motor neurons, you actually start to match that. The mirroring of that is actually on a, on a brain pathway level. So, you know, you can be walking next to them and then you start to slow down and they're going to start to slow down. You walk up and you're like, I know, I can't believe I'm here. And then, you know, it's just, it's just what a stressful day. And you're just dropping your shoulders and you're relaxing. And that again is, is going to help engage them. And they're going to see you as a safe place. They're also going to see you as somebody that kind of has it together. Like they were agitated and they were able to relax. So I'm going to be able to relax too. And offering choices. Anytime that you can offer choices, that's the best thing that you can do. So non-complementarity um, is kind of an interesting thing of not matching the tone or the message of the other person. Um, so the one of the good videos, and there's some examples out there, is you know this guy went and um, had a gun and came up on this group of people that were having a cookout and flashed the gun and was like, I'm going to you know kill you, I'm going to kidnap you, we're going to do this. And the person said, you want a glass of wine? 
And it just totally flipped the tables. It totally changed everything um, that was happening and really de-escalated the situation um, because it seems so out of left field. And it wasn't mocking. It was from a genuine place. Um, and the person ended up sitting down and they had a glass of wine. It's a really interesting story. So what are the ways that you can do that? You know, so one of the things that I've done in the past is, you know, we get the call, agitated person coming in and everybody's already revved up. And I walk up and like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that you're okay. I heard it was a bad car accident. How are you? Are you all right? And again, you're, you're talking to them from a genuine perspective. You're getting their attention. You're being the only person talking and you're totally just changing the subject. You know, you're not addressing the fact that there's five cops and they're shackled to the bed. You're saying like, wow, you know, that sounds like it was a really stressful day. Like, what can we do to make this a little bit better? So some specific populations and things to pay attention to is dementia. Um, you know, it's it's extremely hard for everybody. Um, the individual knows that they can't remember, and that's very frustrating. That's very scary. And then the individual you're saying, like, I've told you four times, this is the this is where we're at. This is where we're going. This is what's going to happen. And it just becomes this kind of hamster wheel of conversation. Um, so what are the ways that you can kind of engage with that? So reminiscing, you know, they're saying, you know, when I was your age, yeah, tell me about it. What was it like? You know, what year is that? What is kind of going on? What was your favorite music you were listening to? What was the food? Having them kind of have a positive reminder as opposed to kind of a lecturing sort of uh, standpoint and just not arguing, um, you know, just kind of getting into that, like, I understand that you want to get out of bed. I understand that you want to do that. And it's frustrating that you can't. So, you know, what else can we do? Can we get you a blanket? Can I get you another pillow? Um, can I get you a turkey sandwich? You know, what kind of things can kind of um, redirect them? And really, you don't want to do the whole um, trying to parent them because they recognize that they're an adult and they feel belittled doing that, which in turn, when you sort of put somebody down, they start to act more childlike. Um, and it becomes this kind of back and forth conversation that can really escalate pretty significantly. So and also talking with autism, um, you know, autism spectrum is obviously a spectrum. There's a lot to unpack there. And so I wanna be very cautious in saying, when we say people with autism, this is no hard and fast rule. This is where getting your collateral information is so, so helpful. So this book is actually co-written by a first responder who has autism um, and talks about calming techniques. And one of the things that you wanna tease out is the difference between a meltdown and a tantrum. So a tantrum is goal directed, you know, is saying like, I want this and you said no, and I want it now. Whereas a meltdown is kind of like the spinning beach ball in your computer of just like, I am an overload, like I can't even right now. So what are the things that we can do to help them sort of get through that, get over the hump in a safe manner? And really asking the family, you know, this is where a lot of times what will happen is it's a caregiver that's not used to the person or the caregiver is just tapped out, you know, the, the individual has been sort of um, going for a couple of days and they just have kind of nothing left in the tank. Um, so say what normally helps in these situations and sometimes they'll say like they just need to sit in a corner and like scream it out. Okay, can we make that happen, you know, can we create that environment that's safe for them to do that, you know, for individuals that headbang or that scratch and things like put socks on their hands and let them scratch, you know, put um, a pillow on the floor and let them head bang. You know, like if that's going to help de-escalate the situation in the end, it's less time and that it'll take for letting them kind of burn through it than you trying to fix the situation for them really don't want to force eye contact. Um, everybody's, again, it's an individual thing of whether the eye contact can be supportive or not, but at the same time, you don't want to avoid eye contact because that just looks shady. So you want to kind of sort of meet their eyes, but not stare and kind of look down. You also don't want to really ask like, how are you feeling? You know, what's going on? Because sometimes that's the hardest thing is to put that into words. One of the best ways to do that is to externally project that like, whew, you know, that that dog over there looks pretty stressed out by all these lights, you know, or man, I'm feeling really uncomfortable. You know, it's a tension. Like I just feel tight and I feel stressed out. And so you putting into words externally, how you're feeling versus asking them, they can just kind of nod and smile or say not for them. Um, but it just helps them to feel again, connected that somebody gets it for them. Minimizing stimulation is huge, 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 huge. And this is again, asking family, do they need some headphones? Do they need something in their ears? You know, can you put a square of gauze in their ears to just decrease the sound a little bit? Um, wrapping them in a blanket really, really tight can sometimes be very helpful. This is like a bear hug, you know, sometimes those actually are the best medicine. It's just sort of sitting with them and letting them sort of rock a little bit and, and kind of cry or scream, but they need to do that to just kind of get it off their chest. 
you really want to be careful about slang lingo and sarcasm, you know, making jokes in these situations because people with autism are often extremely literal and particularly when they're stressed out, it's even harder for them to kind of get jokes. So just being very careful about the word choices that you're making. And that goes true for, for uh, dementia and things like that as well, where you can't make sort of um, modern day jokes. Um, you have to be just very cautious about what words you're using. And then really caregiver support. Um, you know, the caregivers have a very stressful job, um, caring for their family member, worrying about them. And then if you're on scene, obviously something is not going well. Um, so reaching out to the caregiver, finding out what else is going on, because the hardest thing is that you leave and then, and they stay, and then a meltdown happens again, kind of what's the next step. So using that back to that safer technique of what is the disposition decision. And we got to be mindful of cultural diversity. So there's a really nice thing called the respond tool um, about building rapport, explaining your purpose, identifying services, encouraging individuals to be proactive, offering assistance, negotiating what's normal and determining next steps. Um, so this is particularly true when individuals that come from countries that don't have the same sort of thing as EMS or it may offer uh, different services. And also, you know, mobile crisis, you might be on scene with mobile crisis and trying to figure out, okay, mobile crisis is doing this, police is doing this, why is EMS here? What is everybody's role? And again, having the one person sort of like, this is my job. That's the person that's their job and sort of highlighting who everybody is and how you guys are going to work together to help the person. Understanding too, that pain and distress may be expressed differently. So we talk about implicit bias. So that's unconscious bias, meaning we know that you're not racist. We know you're not a biased person, but how you interpret situations is culturally, you know, um, influenced. And so you come up on screen on scene and somebody is screaming and crying. You think, oh, they're hysterical. What does hysterical mean? You know, why is that your kind of go-to diagnosis when you see that situation versus somebody that's really calm, cool, and collected, but maybe they're having a sickle cell crisis, but they're so used to dealing with chronic pain that they just internalize and sort of shut down. And the pain scales, you know, you know are not great. Um, so having to find that balance between listening and, and observing and figuring out what's the right thing to do in that situation for that person. And understanding too that your gender and background may impact the comfort of care being provided. Um, so that's something you can't change, but sort of addressing again, the elephant in the room sort of saying like, hey, is it okay that I'm this person or this background? Um, because you have to remember, you know, undressing somebody, particularly if you're a male provider and it's a female patient or vice versa may create more distress. So how can you find that balance between assessing a patient, but also allowing them to have some agency and not making the situation a little bit worse? All right, that didn't work. <laughs> so what's our next step? Reviewing the ABCs, you know, getting back to basics. So glucose is the number one thing. Um, and I will say, you know, coming at somebody with a lancet may not be the best idea, but if they're already bleeding, blood is blood. You can check a glucose and at least get a ballpark figure. Hypoxia, you know, are they hyperventilating or are they hypoxic? Um, you know, and looking at their oxygen level and, and seeing if that has something to do with it. Being hyperthermic can cause altered mental status, shock in general from any source, and of course a head injury, and then intoxication, intoxication and withdrawal. So this is where, again, using your partners, you know, one of you's talking, one of you sort of doing it, the other person setting things up, but you don't want to purposefully distract. You want to sort of explain because then they think something's happening that you're plotting something. So you say, you know, while we're talking, my partner is going to get some things set up just in case we need them. Doesn't mean that we do, but we'd like to be always prepared. Um, you know, it's clear that you're not feeling good today. And we just want to make sure if you start to feel worse in any way that we're ready to care for you. It's not false. It's exactly what you're doing. It's explaining it without trying to, you know, add fuel to the fire. So having your intubation equipment, um, having restraints and then positioning, you know, when you come on scene, how is the patient already positioned? Not just when you arrive, but how were they positioned? You know, had they been face down for a while and they only recently got, were able to roll onto their side or sit up and then also having the doc on the box, you know, like, who are we going to call? What are the questions we're going to ask? What information do we have? So Project Beta talks about medication and they stress over and over and over again, if it's medical, fix that first. Um, because we know that restraining and, and um, sedating a patient is gonna cause a lot of problems, not to mention just kind of the moral injury of being sedated against your will, especially if it's a medical root cause. Now, usually you would wanna offer PO medications, obviously you guys are limited in that, you know, so what can you offer? Um, and, and couching that saying like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have that in a pill form. I only have it as a shot. Would you like it by an IV or an IM? 
And antipsychotics are first line of psychiatric and origin for sedation. And that's because you're also starting the process to fixing whatever the underlying issue was. So you get your geodon or your Haldol on board first. As that wears off though, it's already starting to treat the underlying psychosis. And that's why that's the recommended medication versus just a benzodiazepine. Second generation antipsychotics, so geodon, Zyprexa, uh, Seroquel, all of those are actually preferred over haloperidol. Um, but if they're agitated due to alcohol, Haldol has the best track record and the most data. But there's no second generation antipsychotics in the means protocols, um, partly because of evidence, partly because of cost. Um, so, you know, we again talking about what's hospital setting versus what you guys have access to. And then if you're using haloperidol, really strongly considering giving it with a benzodiazepine to lower the side effect risk. So for memes, um, 18 to 69, you're gonna do Haldol 5 and Midazolam 5. Remember that you can mix that in the same syringe. So if you're really worried about being able to have access or um, you know, you're kind of struggling and tussling with a patient, you might wanna put it in the same syringe. It's just one needle one time and one sharp to watch. Over 69, you're doing half of the above doses and you may do one, wait a little bit and then do the second, depending on the situation. And then acuting a, and a, treating an acute dystonic or EPS um, syndrome with diphenhydramine, so with Benadryl. And that's where we get the B52 from. So, you know, five of Haldol, two of Adidan, 50 of um, Benadryl is, you know, five, two, 50. So um, you can do that prophylactically. Um, that's really gonna snow them though. So you need to be very prepared for both um, supporting them on an oxygenation level and also the fact that you're gonna get nothing else out of them as far as the story is concerned. Any additional doses of medication do require medical approval. So agitated kids, um, you know, and, and we're talking little kids that can go like Tasmanian devil all the way up to kids that are kids, but are big kids and can cause just as much damage as an adult. 5% of all pediatric ER visits are related to a mental health complaint and upwards of 10% of those require a restraint of some kind. So in general, starting with an extra dose of home medications is what's recommended, um, partly because kids tend to have a paradoxical reaction to medications on a much more frequent basis than adults. So we know those kids that you give them Benadryl and they just get ramped up. And sometimes you don't know that ahead of time. And that's the last thing you wanna do when you're stuck in the back of an ambulance with them. Project Beta said, go ahead and consider an antipsychotic if they aren't on home meds or you don't have access to the kind of meds they're on at home. So olanzapine, risperdal, quetiapine, haloperidol, and clomazine. But they really recommend avoiding olanzapine with benzodiazepines. There's been some case reports of, of marked respiratory depression requiring intubation. Um, so if you're going to have, if you had access to olanzapine, you really don't want to use the benzos with that. Remember too that guanfacine and clonidine, so they're alpha blockers, they are actually FDA approved for ADHD and use them all the time for agitation, impulsivity. The idea being that it sort of brings down that sympathetic nervous response um, in addition to just having a calming effect. The issue, of course, you don't wanna bottom out their blood pressure, but if they're super agitated, they can probably handle a small dose of clonidine or guanfacine. So, you know, the, the baby beta, which is the adolescents and pediatric patients, um, PO recommendations, as well as PO or IM options, but we really want to avoid IM medications in the pediatric population. It is super traumatizing for everyone involved, for the people that have to hold them, the people administering them, you know, they're often crying. They remind you of your own kids. It's just a really stressful situation. So this is where again, like, Hey, you know, dude, seems like things are really getting out of hand. If we give you a pill to take, do you think you could take it for me? Um, and also the options of having the sublingual and the liquid options is really good too, mixing it in with something, but you want to avoid that coercion. They're going to taste it. They're going to know that something's different about it. So kind of being upfront and just saying like, it looks like we need to give you some medication. Can I mix it in with something to, to help the taste be a little bit better? Um, often is better than you trying to hide it from them and then them cheeking it or spitting it at you. But of course, then there's the means protocol, which is how to only. Um, so less than five years, basically they're hoping that they're small enough that you can do something else. Of course, then you do have to worry about rhabdo or something because of them fighting against restraints. Five to 12 years old, you're gonna do Halperidol and you're gonna do a weight-based dose for that. So trying to get as accurate a weight as possible, remembering that the Breslow tapes and stuff aren't always the greatest for obese kids. And then as they get older, you're gonna do um, half and full strength adult doses. Um, the, the MEMS protocols did say by age does not say by weight, um, but you just need to be mindful of that. And, and it's more concern if they're underweight and you do a bigger dose based on their age than the other way of them being underdosed and then needing to call for approval of a second dose. 
So prolonged QT and antipsychotics, we need to address it. Um, the risk is absolutely there. You know, it's funny when you start kind of digging into some of the evidence, particularly about some of the medications that were kind of taken off the market and now are back. Um, when you look at all those prolonging issues, it's often kind of the Swiss cheese effect where they have so many things going on that it lines up to be a bad outcome. So it's a QT prolonged medication, then they're drunk, then they've been vomiting and they're agitated. And so you have all these things that are altering their electrolytes and then they have a prolonged QT and then they end up having a torsades or something like that. And this is again, another reason to really focus on verbal de -escalation. If you can take the steam out of them to where they don't need a medication or use a less dose, then you're, you're in a better setting than needing a higher dose and then having an, an adverse outcome. Remember that antipsychotics are preferred to agitation of, from alcohol intoxication, but benzos are the medication of choice for agitation from alcohol withdrawal. And this is again, where some people kind of hedge their bets and just give both medicines. But if you don't need both, that's kind of the direction if you're deciding between one or the other that you want to head. So ketamine, 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 um, you know, it's the, what's old is new is old is new. Um, and just, you know, it's, it's in a lot of different aspects now. So it is part of the alternative to opioids protocols for pain relief, both in an emergency department setting, as well as pain management practices. There is an FDA, um, excuse me, there, there are clinics that are looking, doing weekly infusions or monthly infusions for depression. Um, you know, those facilities are supposed to be equipped with a whole bunch of uh, good things to necessitate a resuscitation, but they don't always have that. So your call may be for agitation secondary to them already getting ketamine and having, you know, a really bad reaction to it. It is not FDA approved for those uses. Um, there is a, um, S-ketamine um, nasal spray that is FDA approved primarily because of a, a, a um, ability to bill and patent aspect necessarily, then it's that much better than ketamine itself. So high dose, obviously we use it for anesthesia and agitation all the time. The kind of going protocols are 400 to 500 milligrams IM once or a weight-based dose to four to five mg per kg. Um, and then you can do a reduced dose with a, as a second line agent, meaning they already got Haldol, they're still, you know, bucking off the bed. So then you're going to give them a, a half dose of ketamine because they didn't respond well to the Haldol. It does have a quicker onset than first generation and second generation antipsychotics, but it also has faster clearing, which is good for you guys because they're not going to clear it before you drop them off. It's bad for us because because you know, they arrive sedated and then 20 minutes later, they're ripping the handcuffs off. Um, but it, it is good from a standpoint of they have an adverse reaction. So we do want to be very cautious about using it when they're acutely psychotic because of that kind of um, the twilight sleep and them sometimes as they come off the ketamine anyways are going to have some issues differentiating from reality. And that can be extremely distressing in and of itself. So they may be sedated for part of that, or they may just be having a really bad trip. And that's just like the worst thing you can do to somebody that already has schizophrenia or psychosis. There are a lot of evolving state protocols we're using ketamine. Um, and, you know, there's something that fear of increased need for intubation is probably not realistic considering how much we use ketamine for like shoulder reductions and procedural sedation without intubation in the emergency department and in the hospital setting in general. But ketamine may not be all that safe. Um, so this is Elijah McLean. Uh, he was a gentleman in Colorado. Um, he was coming home from the store and um, got into it with police and the paramedics were called by police specifically to administer restraint. And that's a, a key thing to point out is because you know, dispatch and you're arriving on scene and you're being told to administer restraint, you kind of wait, why am I doing this? What's going on? What don't I know? What's the other story about why I'm being asked to do this? And at the time he was pinned down by police in a chokehold and handcuffed. He had vomited several times while restrained prior to EMS arrival, but there was vomit all around. So it was clear what had happened in that regard. The police though implied excited delirium. And the way that they said that was like, his, he's stronger than he should be. You know, he's busting out of our holds. Um, you know, he needs, to be, he needs to be restrained medically. Um, you need to give him something. You know, he's probably on some kind of drugs or he's coming off of something um, and he's gonna be dangerous to you guys. So the paramedics gave 500 milligrams of ketamine. Now there's differing reports on whether this was a standard dose versus a miscalculation of a weight-based dose. Um, Mr. McLean was, you know, not a big guy. You can see from his photo, he's skinny, um, but he also wasn't that tall. He was maybe 160 pounds soaking wet. Um, so the 500 milligrams was a pretty big dose if you're doing weight-based calculation. So he ended up suffering a cardiac arrest en route to the hospital. They did resuscitate him, but he suffered an anoxic brain injury and he was removed from life support three days later. 
So in just in February of this year, an, an external investigation. So the initial internal investigation said, you know, it was just bad news. It was excited delirium, blah, blah, blah. But an, an investigation found both the police and the paramedics at fault and they're facing potential charges. Um, and the reason being is that the police had him handcuffed inappropriately, restrained inappropriately for an extended period of time. You know, after he had vomited, they didn't roll him over or sit him up or anything like that. Um, and then also that the fact that the paramedics gave a dose without a um, complete assessment on their part, and that the dose again was inappropriate based on his weight and his level of agitation. Um, so this is again, one of those bad things happen and how can we learn from that? How can we do a better job? So what is excited delirium? You know, what, what is this that we're talking about? So delirium versus dementia versus depression. I just, I always like this graph because it just kind of clarifying again, what are we talking about? So delirium is an acute onset and you can have waxing waning delirium. You know, we talk about sundowning sometimes where just the evening hours or the bewitching hours where their mentation is fluctuating, their level of consciousness is often altered. So they'll go from sedate to really agitated very quickly. Their attention is very impaired. So they're, you know, distractible. They're looking all over. They're difficult to follow. Um, and their psychomotor agitation agitation or retardation. So what that means is they can be very sluggish, very slow to respond, or the agitation of their very rapid, very jittery, hyperreflexia, that sort of thing. Delirium is reversible. It's usually a medical cause versus dementia and depression where that's not going to happen. The dementia and depression, you know, they may have these episodes, like I said, of sundowning where they're really agitated within it, um, but it's a slow burn versus, you know, acutely changing. So excited delirium specifically is psychosis with physical distress, super duper high fatality rates. Two thirds of the individuals with excited delirium never make it to the hospital, no matter what you do, because it's a precipitated kind of body going haywire. And instead of shutting down like in shock where they're somnolent, difficult to arouse, it's the polar opposite where everything is just 110%. So it can happen due to intoxication, to withdrawal, especially stopping and starting meds. So they may not be overdosing per se, but like they haven't taken their meds in two weeks and then they take their daily prescribed meds all at once. But also recent taser injury. So again, figuring out what happened before you got there um, and, and that assessment of, okay, what do I see right now? What's happening with this patient? What's happening around them? You know, if there's a bunch of cops and they're all sweaty and a couple of them have a black eye, then they were clearly tussling for a while. That makes you again, think this person's pretty agitated. In. It may look like a lot of different things. It may be a lot of different things. It's one of those can't miss, but also don't want to just brush it off as being that. So treatment is actually fluids, 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 and getting the temperature down. Lactated ringers is preferred. You also want to check the sugar. The big thing with this is that you want to do benzos or ketamine, no antipsychotics or antihistamines. And this is where I don't envy you guys, you know, trying to make a decision on the fly of, is this psychosis? Is this intoxication versus this excited delirium? Because you pick the wrong one and you could have a really bad outcome. Um, but at the same time, you pick ketamine for something that's just a psychosis and you can make them a lot worse that way as well. I thought I saw a question. So I just wanted to pause a second and check that out. Okay, perfect. So what does the memes protocol say? Fluid bolus, um, and then checking a glucose and then a temp. And they caveat with checking a temp of if possible, um, because they recognize this isn't somebody that's going to, you know, hold a thermometer under their tongue for the 15 seconds. Medical consult, medical consult as soon as possible. Um, you know, partly to protect you guys, but also to let them know that this is somebody coming in pretty darn sick. So the ketamine is one mg per kg IV or IO, maximum dose is 100 milligrams, and then do a medical consultation if you want to do midazolam on top of that. You can do IM, um, the MEMS protocol goes with the lower end of four mg per kg to a max dose of 400 milligrams. Um, and then if, again, the severe agitation persists, you can do midazolam, but you need to have medical consultation to do that. So they're you know, giving you the permission to use the ketamine, they're going on the lower side of that dose, um, and again, it's a difficult thing of, do you do 200 milligrams and have them still be agitated or do you do the 400 milligrams and just be prepared? 
very clear in the MEMS protocols, the patient must be transported by an ALS provider in a supine position. So as we talked about with Elijah is that part of it was he was face down. So there was a concern about aspiration, um, but also we know about just the posturing, the difficulty breathing when you're in a prone position. So get them on their back, get them upright as soon as they can, get them uncuffed as soon as you can and keep them on a monitor. Now, some, some people will um, argue to go ahead and put pads on them, the defib pads, because just again, the high risk of something happened, but often they're sweating so much that the pads don't stick, but having them ready to go is important. So workplace violence, you know, we're talking about some pretty stressful situations. We know that it's multifactorial. It's what we do, where we do it, how we're interacting, you know, two o'clock in the morning outside of the bar, nothing good is happening. <laughs> yep. Mental health. Is that, uh, your question? Not what Randy's doing. Yeah, it is. is it? All, right. All right. Um, so workplace violence is considered an OSHA issue. Um, Jayco has their own little alert system for it. So basically they're supposed to be keeping track of the number of times that it happens, but we know that it's underreported. Always has been, you know, it's part of the job, it's what you signed up for, and the hassle of having to deal with the paperwork, right? So rates are increasing slightly, but also we're being increasingly vocal about what we experience and what we're kind of willing to tolerate. Like, it's not okay that you say these things or do these things to me, you know, like, it's just not, it's not all right. So we know though that restraint and seclusion is the avenues we're most likely to be harmed and inflict unintentional harm on a patient. So again, that importance of de-escalation, let's not get to the point where we have five people pinning somebody to a bed and we're trying to inject them with the medication. And of note, legislation was just passed just last month, um, allowing the employer to go to court on your behalf, because that is absolutely something we say, it was like, ah, oh, you know, I have to take off of court, I have to file a police report, and I'm going to go, and they're just going to throw it out, and it's going to be useless. So now your employer can go to court on your behalf um, for, the, for workplace violence episodes that happen. And this includes for you guys. So workplace violence, it's not your place of work is in the streets. So if you experience those kind of things, or if there's after effects like stalking or harassment um, from a, a prior patient, you can absolutely press charges and that your employer can go on your behalf. So we're gonna take a few second breather here. We're gonna switch gears and we're gonna look at substance use and other mental health conditions of interest. So let's talk about addiction. Um, and I think this is really important. We know that the pandemic has um, kind of hidden a lot of things and also amplified a lot of things. Episodes of binge drinking and drug use escalated. And we know that the statistics are just going to be behind that nobody was really keeping track because we had other things to do. Um, but it didn't go away. And if anything, it probably made it a lot worse. So what is addiction? It's a reward pathway in your brain that communicates via, via dopamine. So this is the same, you know, rush that you get when you win the lotto, the scratch and win lotto or the slot machines. It's the same thing you get from having really good food, um, but also all your drugs and alcohol. Um, it communicates by a dopamine pathway. We used to talk about a psychological versus a physical addiction. You know, I'm physically addicted to my pain medicine because I take it every day, but I'm not an addict because that's a psychological addiction. You really can't separate them. Um, they're kind of a spectrum -y. you know, you may lean towards one or the other, but they're going to be interrelated. And we know this because of the Vietnam War too. So right before the Vietnam War ended, um, several senators went to Vietnam and they were you know, talking with the soldiers and visiting them. And they were kind of gobsmacked because they were seeing super high rates of opium and heroin abuse. So upwards of 20% of soldiers were actively using substances in, during the Vietnam War. And they thought, oh my God, all of these guys are gonna be coming back home addicts. Like, how are we gonna manage this? This is gonna just flood the system. We're not prepared for this. How are we gonna manage it? And interestingly, only about 5% of those, of those individuals continue to use substances once they came home. The reason being access is obviously different. You're at the place of supply versus having to come here and, and find it a little bit harder. And then also the stressors, you're not in an active war zone. You know, you're able to go to a normal job, have your family, be in a secure situation. So, you know, of those people that were actively using substances, only about 5% continue to use substances. So we know that psychological, physical, addiction, you're going to have withdrawal, but it doesn't mean that you're going to have to continue to use. And some argue that this is purely a disease of human connection. So uh, Johan Hari wrote some really good books about chasing the scream, talking about the war on drugs and how that's probably not accurate to be doing that. And the idea being, of course, that, you know, 
that we're looking at a lot of different factors, um, stress levels, you know, social media, all these things that are actually creating distance um, between people is actually st stressing us out. And we're turning to drugs and alcohol to feel better. And the example that he really teases apart is Rat Park. And so the idea between addiction um, stemmed out of some research where they put rats in cages and they gave them a water bottle with regular water and a water bottle laced with cocaine or heroin or something like that. And what they found initially was that the rats went to the water bottle with the substance you know, uniformly to the point where they stopped eating, they became depressed and they would even die. And so the idea of like, oh my gosh, these drugs are terrible. Like you will use this drug until you die. But then they sort of said, like, it doesn't make sense in the context of like the Vietnam War is all those people should have kept using, they should have isolated, become homeless and continue to use until they die. So why did that not happen? And what they looked at is the rat's environment itself. So when they initially did this study, they put the rat in those little plastic bins and gave them their water bottle. And that was kind of it. But that's not how rats live. Rats are social animals. So they created what they called rat park. So they had a bigger enclosure. They had little toys and things and nesting areas. And they had little boy rats and little girl rats and they let them all kind of hang out. They still had the two water bottles and very few of the rats used any of the water with the substance laced because they didn't need to. They had social connection. They had their friends, their family. They had things to do to keep them occupied. They didn't need to sort of escape by using a substance. So again, that idea that if we create that network and that infrastructure to support somebody, they're more likely to get sober. And this is when we talk about comprehensive harm reduction. So allowing that person the opportunity to get sober and create an infrastructure of recovery, they're more likely to do that versus putting them in jail and then expecting them to suddenly kick the habit. Others will say that it's also a developmental or learning disorder. You know, you learn maladaptive behaviors of dealing with your environment by utilizing substances. And, and we see this in the sense that you find very few 40 and 50 year olds that are actively using substances. Um, what will often happen is like, yeah, I, you know, was really kind of crashed and burned through my 20s. And then I kind of hit rock bottom and I got myself out of it. But a lot of people hit a lot of rock bottoms and keep hitting the rock bottoms, but a lot more of it just kind of grow out of it. Um, so that idea again of like, as your brain matures, you learn some alternative coping skills, you kind of don't need that anymore. So we look to at ESPERT, um, and you hear that over and over and over again, ESPERT, Screening, Brief Intervention and Referral to Treatment. So this just is an acronym um, that's got a lot, of, a lot of press time. And the idea being that you just start screening, you just start asking people. Now, as pre-hospital personnel, we're not expecting you to do this, but you can really lay a strong groundwork for them having a great interaction when they hit the emergency department. Um, you guys really make or break a lot of our patient interactions. Um, you know, by you being there and having that open conversation, you know, some of my favorite EMTs are like, hey, you know, Jim and I, the patient, and I were talking on our way in and, and I told him about some of the services you guys can connect him with. You just set me up to be a superhero because I can swoop in and be like, great, thanks. Glad you started that conversation. Here you go, Jim, let's connect you with this. And then we're going to have our peer recovery specialist come and talk to you versus, you know, kind of lecturing or giving them a hard time. You're like, oh God, this is the fourth time we've picked you up this week. Um, you know, what are you going to do? You know, you're killing your mom, you know, you're breaking your girlfriend's heart. That just makes them feel shitty. And then they don't want to engage in services when they come to see us. So what you're going to do is ask those open-ended questions. You're going to summarize, use that reflective listening. You're really listening for change talk. And you don't realize they're saying it all the time. So people are like, I know, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to end up dead one of these days. Wow. So you realize how much this is kind of sucking the life out of you. Um, you know, one of my favorite lines is always like, I don't even know you and I'm worried about you. You know, we just met and I'm already kind of concerned. Like, this is a tough spot to be in. I'm like, yeah, you know, I've been trying to get sober for five years now and I just can't do it. What keeps getting in your way? You know, what kind of gets you off the track that you're on? And just listening. And even you don't have to fix it for them. They don't expect you to fix it, but just listening and creating that opportunity for them to express how they can get into to recovery is the best thing you can do. Motivational interviewing and healthcare is a great little guidebook. Again, looking for that language that you can start to adopt um, to incorporate into you your patient interactions um, is really helpful. So how it can go. So this is, you know, kind of, again, flipping that script, you know, instead of being like, wow, you're drunk again, or you overdosed again, we had a Narcan, you say, what do you like about it? You know, what is, tell me about what is being high or being drunk or being altered do for you? And then sort of challenging them, you know, so I heard you say that this is the time, this is the time you're going to quit it. You know, how likely are you to not use in the next two weeks on a scale of one to 10, 10 being hundred percent. And if they say I'm hundred percent sure, 
you know that they're kind of fibbing a little bit to themselves, but you can kind of say, well, do you think there's anything else that could get in your way? Or if they say like, oh, I'm going to cut drinking, I'm going to, I'm going to cut back to like, you know, a case a week. Well, how, you know, how likely is that to happen? What kind of things would get in your way? And if they say, oh, I'm like 70% sure, well, why not 50%? Why are you 70% sure? Or alternatively, why aren't you hundred percent sure that you can cut back your drinking and sort of engage them in that conversation, get them thinking about their own recovery and what they need. And then they can ask us in the hospital or on discharge planning, hey, you know, I talked about, I'm thinking this is what I want to do, but this is the kind of supports that I need versus me telling them what I think they need. And then it doesn't work for them. And they just feel like a failure again. So some hot topics and addiction to cover for you guys. So I mentioned comprehensive harm reduction. What does that all mean? It means a lot of different stuff. So using point of care, HIV and hepatitis C, you know, telling them right then and there, like, Hey, you know, I'm worried about you. Why don't we get you tested? Then you can know that you're safe in this day and time looking at contraception. Um, and you have to be careful. We don't want to be coercing people into using contraception. We don't want to say like, you're using drugs. You shouldn't get pregnant because to be totally honest, pregnancy is the prime time to get sober. Not that, that I'm endorsing individuals who use drugs to get pregnant because it's a lot to manage, obviously, but that is a great time for sobriety. So even if they're worried that they might get pregnant, sometimes that can kind of tip them over the edge of like taking some better care of themselves. Looking at the overdose fatality review teams. So in Maryland, all the local health departments um, and local districts set these up. It is incredible when we have EMS involved on those fatality review teams, because you guys, you know, the scenes, you know, the people, you know, the players, um, you know, where you go every weekend for your calls. So you can give us that perspective that sometimes at the hospital and in the health department setting, we don't always know. So getting involved is really helpful for that. Talking about safe injection sites and needle exchange is obviously uh, very politically um, hot topics. But the idea again is that we're trying to keep these people as healthy as possible until they can get to a point in recovery. So, you know, it's hard enough to get sober. It's even harder when you know that you have HIV or hepatitis C and you tend to give up more if you have those conditions, in addition to the, the risk of, that you're putting the community at by continuing to use and share needles or other um, uh, paraphernalia with other individuals. So looking at educational options, looking at legal services, you know, that that point that we talk about, like you just got out of jail, you have no place to live, you have no job, you have fines to pay, and we want you to get sober. So how can we kind of bridge that? How can we help you be more successful? I mentioned peer support. So a peer is a person with a lived experience in substance use or mental health in particular. So again, that's in the emergency department, me walking up and being like, dude, you're using versus somebody saying like, you know what? They saved my life in that room right next door. I used to use two and look at me now. Like that's a totally different conversation. So engaging in the peers has been phenomenal for our community. Um, you know, one of the things, the data on the bottom of the screen there. So we tried to screen all of our patients uh, 12 years in order for substance use, not because we thought the 12 year olds were using substances, but our screening tool is also looking at for risk-taking behaviors. So are they getting in the car with somebody that's been drinking or driving? Um, is their home situation safe? And we actually caught a couple of kind of abusive situations or neglect situations that way. So in the first nine months of the program, we had 2,800 positive screens. So that means positive for risky drug or alcohol use. And our peer recovery um, coaches were able to engage 330 people in treatment, meaning not just making the appointment, but they showed up for treatment. So it's 330 people in nine months. So they more than paid for their salary. Um, but also the stress level on the staff was monumental. You know, initially, a lot of the staff were kind of like, wait a minute, you're going to bring somebody with a history of drug use into the ER with drugs all around and people using and they were kind of suspect about it but it got to the point where they're like oh what do you mean the peers off sick today well what are we supposed to do because they recognized the value that the peer had of having that conversation and then what the peer would do is they'd say okay if you can hold this patient here until 9 p.m i can get them an uber and then we're going to get them into treatment tonight they would do all of that legwork for us and then the patient was engaged because they felt like they had kind of people behind them really champion their tramping their uh, recovery so talking about medication options, just to review the big three, these are the, um, when we talk about medications for opiate use disorder or medication assisted therapy. So methadone is a full agonist. So the problem, you tend to have the most methadone overdoses when people are first starting or withdrawing because it takes so long to have an effect because it has to fill all of the receptors. Methadone can absolutely cause a prolonged QT. So needing to be cautious with your Zofran doses. And this is where you get a lot of dental issues and calcium issues. Um, Methadone can only be prescribed for opiate use disorder through an opiate treatment program. So that's your methadone clinics. 
But as I'm sure you guys have encountered, you can get methadone for pain management without um, needing a special licensure or facility license. So buprenorphine, which is suboxone, is a partial agonist. So it only partially fills the receptors. Now you'll get the occasional patient that says, oh, I can't take that shit. I'm allergic to it. In actuality, they're probably having precipitated withdrawal because you have to be have more of your receptors empty than filled when you take your first dose because it kicks the opioids out. So if somebody says, I took a dose of my suboxone and now I'm violently ill, I'm vomiting, I'm shaky, you actually give them another dose of suboxone to fill the receptors and that would help them feel better. Right now, you have to have a special DEAX waiver to prescribe this, but the Department of Health and Human Services just said, at least for physicians, that that can go away and probably go away for PAs and NPs too. Um, in emergency department settings, you do not need the waiver to do this. You can give them a single dose at that time, up to three days in a row. So basically as a transition to getting them into a treatment program. And then naltrexone, so not naloxone, naloxone is Narcan, but naltrexone is an opioid agonist, excuse me, antagonist. So it's actually used for both opioids and alcohol as a pill or as a once monthly injection. You do have to be opioid free for seven to 10 days before starting, but it's a really, really good medication. Now, the problem with all of these medicines is you're on this medicine and then you fall and break a hip. How do you guys manage their pain? You can still give the pain medications, you know, fentanyl or morphine if you need to, but you're going to need more to get the effect. And then you have such a small therapeutic window of where they're going to stop breathing on you. So again, really important to have that pulse ox monitor and kind of keep talking to them, making sure that they're staying awake. And then as part of your handoff, you explain that they have, that they're maintained on a, a chronic medication um, so that we can treat them appropriately too. So opiate detox, lofexidine is the only FDA approved medication for opiate withdrawal. It's an alpha blocker. So same category as clonidine and guanfacine, but of course the FDA approval means branded medication, um, but you can really use any of them the same. Otherwise we're doing symptomatic support. So we're just getting them medications to help them feel better as they get through the, the first week there. So you're giving them medicines to sleep like trazodone and Remeron. You're giving medicines for puking. So Phenergan, Regalin, Zofran, body aches. So baclofen and flexoril and then Tylenol Motrin. Gabapentin, um, gabapentin I have mixed feelings about. And the reason being is it works really, really good, but in some ways it works too well. And there's increasing street value. There's also one of our local uh, pediatricians has seen a couple of really bad cases of neonatal abstinence syndrome um, from mothers that are taking gabapentin either prescribed or off the street during the last stages of their pregnancy. So it's probably going to become increasingly more restricted, um, but it's, it's a good issue medication, just sometimes overused. So with the clonidine and gabapentin, as I just said, um, increasing rates of abuse actually for both of them. So gabapentin does have a caution about respiratory depression. It does not respond to naloxone. So this is purely supportive care, sometimes requiring intubation. And as I mentioned, the complicated neonatal withdrawal that can be very protracted. Clonidine overdose also can happen both because, you know, the little kid gets into this, into their parents' blood pressure medication, um, or as I mentioned, it's, it's FDA approved for ADHD. So they take too much of it. Um, or somebody that's withdrawing knows that it helps with the tremor and the shakes and the palpitations. So they keep taking doses, trying to feel better. And then they stop or they run out. So you can hypertension with rebound, hypotension, bradycardia, somnolence. There is some interesting case reports that Narcan can help with a clonidine overdose, but we're talking like 10 milligrams. So this is kind of that like throw everything in the kitchen sink at the patient while you're trying to get them there. And oftentimes your rigs don't carry enough Narcan to do that. And then clonidine withdrawal obviously can result in a hypertensive crisis. So just being mindful that that's a potential source if that's a medication the patient's prescribed. So the nice Narcan wake up, and this is something, you know, you say like, you want what? Um, the idea is again, that we, you don't want to punish a patient, you know, Narcan, giving somebody Narcan for a withdrawal is a terribly painful syndrome. I mean, you're, you're ripping off every single bandaid all at once, you know, and, and it's excruciating. Um, so yes, we want them to be breathing, but we don't want them to be vomiting and swinging. And part of that again is from a, just a being pleasant, but also that they're more likely to engage in services. So, you know, the person they're not breathing, you push multiple doses to get them to wake up and then they come just up spitting, you know, they hate you, you know, F you, you ruined their high um, and all those sorts of things. And, and there's no winning with that, but they're still alive. But if you have the option, 
don't give them more than you need to. Remember that we do IV, IMIO, but you can also do Narcan by a nebulizer. So if they're breathing at least six times a minute, they're breathing enough to probably get the Narcan in through a nebulizer at an, at an adequate dose, and that'll just continue to slowly bring them around. And again, why be nice? Because they're more likely to engage in services if we've let them sleep it off versus waking them up in, in such a fashion. So in the ED, um, more and more emergency departments are introducing buprenorphine or Suboxone. So it started in 2015, a study out of Yale said, hey, you know, what ends up happening is these patients withdraw or we give them Narcan. And then we say, you know, you wanna get sober. We try to give them a referral to a clinic. It takes a couple of days and they relapse. What if we gave them the buprenorphine in the emergency department? And so what they did is they first just did a, can we do it? Is there a problem? Has anything happened? And then what they did as a follow-up study is see how many of those people continue to engage in treatment services. And when you engage them, when you start their Suboxone in the ER, they are markedly more likely to continue to be sober um, three, six, and nine months afterwards. California has actually done an incredible job of this. They call it the bridge program. And so they actually have EMS diversion to hospitals where they do buprenorphine induction when the chief complaint is opiate related. So basically just like a stroke alert, it's kind of like an opiate alert and they'll go to the hospital that has peer recovery or has um, you know drug and alcohol services in the emergency department or with like a co-located um, as, a, as a preferential drive. Um, so this is something to consider um, and think about. You're gonna hear more and more places doing it. Um, and the idea, you know, people, won't they just be coming in for a fix? Well, they're going to be coming in anyways. You know, that's, that's one of the things is um, unless you're really getting kind of fast and loose with how much medication you're prescribing, but giving them a single dose isn't really going to hurt them. Um, if anything, it's going to help engage them in services. And just a reminder that, you know, we talk about addicts and we talk about those people, but all of those people are somebody to somebody else. Um, and whatever we can do to kind of support them and get them one day closer to recovery is important. And I get it. It is so incredibly frustrating when you've given somebody Narcan several days in a row. But then, you know, we have to think about why are they continuing to use to such a level where they're overdosing every day? Um, you know, and there's there's been a lot of legislative push that if you overdose, that that should be considered a suicide attempt and qualify you for an, an automatic 72 hour hold. That's actually the law in New Jersey. And the problem is, of course, getting services to match with that. Um, you know, you all of a sudden have everybody that overdosed now as an involuntary psych hold and we already are boarding psych patients for such long times in the state. It's just not something that's sustainable at this point. So talking about neonatal exposure, so NOFAS is uh, for fetal alcohol syndrome, but remember that neonatal exposure can be to any substance. So there's neonatal abstinence historically refers to opiates, um, but as mentioned, gabapentin now falls in that, and then there's fetal alcohol syndrome. And it can really have a delayed presentation depending on mom's use pattern and breastfeeding status. So, you know, if mom stopped using in her third trimester or was using right up until the time of delivery versus, and if she, how much she's using during breastfeeding. But having a neonatal absence syndrome impairs bonding. Um, you know, the kid, the infant is more likely to be crying and um, difficult to console. And that impairs bonding, which also increases the risk of abuse um, against, the, against the infant. So this is one of those opportunities where every time you interact with somebody that has a baby is talking about sleep, safe sleeping. And it's not just the back to sleep, but also sleeping environment. So we've done a really good job of saying like, don't co-sleep in the bed. So what ends up happening is they fall asleep on the couch or in a recliner because they're thinking, well, I can't sleep with the kid in the bed and they just need to sleep or they fall asleep back to and, only, and then they're more likely to suffer a, a suffocation um, in a couch or, or something like that. So if you're responding for something else, you see that there's a baby involved, just, hey, mentioning like, hey, you know, safe sleep. If you need a crib, most of the health departments have kind of crib um, programs where they can get them a safe sleeping environment. And that goes a long way. Okay. So responding to this um, sudden unexplained death of an infant or the brief resolved unexplained event calls, um, scene preservation is important, really asking the police to assist. And it's hard, you know, when you guys respond, you don't, A, the infant may still be alive or you might get a heartbeat back by the time you leave the scene. And it's not always clear if a crime has occurred. So it's this kind of iffy line of whether or not police can stay on scene and secure the scene or not. So if there's an opportunity, if you're concerned, taking pictures um, if possible, 
there's been some talk about getting EMS body cams, at least in these kind of situations, um, both to protect you, but also to try and see if a crime has potentially occurred um, and scene preservation, but really document, 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 document. Um, I now serve as part of our fetal infant mortality review team. And that's one of the biggest things that we have is when the EMS report doesn't line up with the police report. And I'm not saying that you guys should, you know, write down all your notes together, but being as detailed as possible um, can really go a long way not just for for prosecuting crimes, but also so that we can figure out what interventions are going to do the most good for reducing um, unintended deaths in the community. So one of those other things to sort of pay attention to is Imodium overdoses. So you, know, you think you've heard it all. Um, so Imodium at super duper 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 high doses can actually give you an euphoria. And at the very least, it can stop an opiate withdrawal sort of syndrome. So we're talking a normal dose is about eight milligrams of over the counter, but case reports are upwards of 400 milligrams a day. And even 40 milligrams a day are gonna cause problems, obviously not just with constipation, but we're talking about calcium channel blockage. Um, it does not respond to Narcan, and you may get a call out for a seizure or an altered mental status. And so if you see like a lot of Imodium or if the family says like, I think their stomach's been bothering them, they've been popping Imodium a lot, even if it wasn't intentional, they may have accidentally overdosed. Um, so there's, you know, what would you normally do if they have torsades due to an Imodium overdose is you do sodium bicar, mag, potassium, that may or may not work. Um, really, you want to put pacer pads on as soon as possible. There's some reports of overdrive pacing as a treatment. So you try to go at the faster pacing to capture and then slowly decrease the pacing rate. Um, so because of the increasing rates of Imodium overdose and then consequently torsades, um, FDA actually asked the makers of, of Imodium to change their packaging. So instead of being able to buy like a bottle of 200, you have to buy them in the individual punch packs, similar to what happened with like Sudafed packaging. So you just couldn't get as many per box and it took more effort to get them out. Pot. Let's talk a little bit about pot. So we know that there's a risk of psychosis with early exposure in adolescence. Um, and this is one of those kind of, you know, chicken or the egg things. Is it a kid that's already sort of maybe hearing things or being sensory kind of overload? So they're using pot as a coping skill. Or what we also think is a distinct possibility is that the pot is so much stronger um, that it's actually inducing a psychotic episode. There's also increasing evidence of cardiovascular effects, again, because of the strength of the THC. So at lower doses, sympathetic activities, so you're seeing tachycardia and hypertension. And then at higher doses, you have this inversion. So the sympathetic, sympathetic activity is inhibited. So you're going to have bradycardia with hypotension. And the idea like, oh, you can't get addicted, you know, and, and I always roll my eyes, I can't help myself, when they say I've done my research. It's like, well, then you would know about cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. So it's absolutely addiction. It's the delirium tremens of pot. So anybody that says like, I can't stop vomiting, the only time I feel good is when I'm in like a hot shower or with a heating pad on my stomach, you immediately wanna think this. I always think this when I have like somebody under 30 that has cyclic vomiting, it's the first thing I ask. The problem is of course, is they say, well, I use pot to help me feel better because it helps with the nausea. And as soon as I don't use it is when I start to puke. Well, actually you're withdrawing, that's the problem. Um, so treatment wise, you can actually use capsaicin, you know, tiger balm or anything like that on the stomach. There's something about a heat receptor on the abdomen that actually reduces the vomiting. Other treatments for the cyclic vomiting episodes are Haldol, Gabapentin, and Acetylcysteine, Mucamus, you know, for your Tylenol overdoses does show to help with cannabis dependence um, and then symptomatic relief. The, one of the keys with this is you've given them lots and lots of Zofran and they're not getting better. Give them a dose of Haldol. Um, it, it instantly stops. You're like, okay, it's cannabis. Like, even if you say it's not, it's, it's pretty classic. The same thing with cyclic vomiting in general is that they don't respond to antiemetics. So caffeine intoxication and overdose. I mean, as we all sit here drinking coffee and things like that, um, a regular cup of coffee, regular, um, has about hundred milligrams of caffeine, which will increase your blood level to about five or six milligrams. So when we talk about a caffeine overdose, we're talking about 30 cups of coffee. Now, nobody can drink that much coffee because you're just going to have to pee too much. Let's be honest. But in reality, what's happening is you're doing um, things that are concentrated or have synergistic effects. So just to case in point, 330 milligrams of coffee is in a medium Starbucks coffee. Starbucks is the most concentrated commercial coffee that's out there, um, you know, compared to McDonald's is two and a half of their largest. Um, so, you know, kind of knowing what's in a can, and this is where the FDA is kind of stepping in a little bit and talking about labeling and stuff like that too. And then you have that whole like, well, is it a supplement that has caf that has a caffeine effect? 
or synergistic effect with caffeine and who regulates that. And it gets a little muddy there, but in general, just kind of keeping that on your radar as a potential um, overdose syndrome. It's just supportive care um, for the most part, um, unless obviously you get super duper sick and then it's just more supportive care. All right, so somatization, factitious, and conversion. I just always like to touch on this because you have those kind of frequent flyers or those things that you just can't figure out what's going on. So somatization is just a singular focus on symptoms. So they think that even normal things are harbingers of badness. And this is probably going to be very true status post COVID where every single sniffle is, oh my God, I got COVID. Um, and the trick is to minimize a workup while not missing a true emergency. So this is the person that every week you're calling with a chest pain complaint. And you know, one of these times they're going to actually have a heart attack, but it's just so hard. So this is when you have that kind of treatment team of discharge planning, they're going to have set appointments, or maybe they always do a call to their cardiologist first. And this is also where we start talking about having a clinician on your EMS unit that can actually do home visits for your frequent flyers or high utilizers can really help decrease both their stress level and your stress level. And the, the formal term is illness anxiety disorder um, can be more focused on a specific diagnosis. Like I'm sure this is my heart attack versus just, oh, what was that? My stomach grumbled, it must be cancer. And they kind of go off to the races in that regard. So factitious disorder though, is where you're trying to be ill, impaired or injured. And there's not really an outcome other than just wanting to be the patient. And this is, you know, Munchausen syndrome or Munchausen syndrome by proxy. So where you may, you know, inject yourself under the skin to make abscesses, or you prick your finger so that it looks like there's blood in your urine, um, because you just like the attention, you like being cared for, you like being a patient. Um, and that's often really hard for us in the medical world to wrap our heads around because we're like, the last place I'd want to be is sick in a hospital. Um, but for some other individuals, it's a very comforting and safe place. So again, if you're seeing those people over and over, kind of casting that wide net of what else could be a source of the symptoms. And this is a little bit different than malingering where it's for secondary gain. So an outright gain of saying like, I'm getting a payout from this. You know, I slipped and fell at the grocery store because you didn't have the wet floor sign out. Um, that can be a malingering complaint. And this is very, very different than conversion disorder. So, you know, we hear the term pseudo seizures and we kind of brush it off and, and pseudo seizures itself is not a term that, that is really, it's falling out of favor because it implies that again, a faking it. True conversion disorder is the way I describe it is it's a physical manifestation of your psychological distress. You know, your, your mind is in such overdrive that your body just says, I give up, you know, you stop being able to see, you stop being able to walk, you lose the ability to speak and they do every test known to mankind and can't find out a source. Um, so, you know, pseudo seizures, you know, the person that's like, oh, I'm collapsing to the ground. That's probably more factitious. Um, whereas a true pseudo seizure is they legitimately are unconscious. Um, they can be incontinent of urine, they can have tongue biting, they can all the symptoms because their brain just basically hits the reset button. Um, so it really is, you know, talking to the person, the conversion disorder will continue until the underlying psychological problem is addressed. Um, so sometimes that means, you know, having to talk about a past trauma, um, maybe they're in an abusive situation, um, and it takes a lot more digging. This is where that kind of kindness factor really comes in, even though it can be absolutely exhausting when it's the same person every single week. So tying that all together, there's this kind of broad term, medically unexplained symptoms. So it's a, it just kind of covers everything. It, it can be used for things like IBS and fibromyalgia, not to be saying that those things don't exist, but it's just medically unexplained, meaning we don't really know the pathology of it. We don't have good tests for it. Um, it just is sort of there. And whenever somebody has something that like, oh, I've been to 10 different specialists and nobody can figure it out. I always do think about a trauma history. Um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I'm triggered and it's, I, you know, trauma informed care and they kind of blow it off or it's, it's sort of a catchphrase. But if you look at the adverse childhood experiences study, um, and this is another good book, the body keeps the score of talking about that connection between, you know, your physical and psychological stress levels. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. And that's, you know, a whole nother talk that we could get into um, relating that, but it has to deal with, you know, chronic exposure to stress hormones just totally throws your uh, immune system out of whack. And then when it's out of whack, you have higher rates of cancer and heart disease and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so if we kind of can address those things or at least call attention to them, we really reduce the impact on um, health as an adult. 
And I really just wanted to kind of touch a little bit on burnout. You know, we're in the middle, middle end, hopefully, of a pandemic. Um, so just being mindful for yourself and your colleagues of what burnout can look at, yeah, look like. You know, it it can be we talk about depression or withdrawal, but it can also just feeling disconnected, kind of out of body. And you know, you just sort of you don't to have the room and the space to care anymore um, and exhausted, overwhelmed, quick to anger, all of those things can be symptoms. But then there's also the secondary trauma, you know, that you're excessively worried, you're sort of feeling on guard all the time, and you may start to have physical symptoms yourself, you know, passing out episodes, even episodes of AFib, um, nightmares triggering, and you're really kind of taking on other people's trauma. So Maryland has started what's called Operation Courage. Uh, so it's mental health support to Maryland's essential workers for free. Um, so there's an online little um, thing that you can do. And then they also offer a free call line during business hours. Um, and it's really just, again, supporting, caring for the caregivers, you know, that we have to be well before we can take care of somebody else. And that's that idea of scene safety or putting your own oxygen on when you're on the plane, um, that we really need to be taking care of ourselves and our colleagues so that we can be the best clinicians possible. So take on points, a lot of what you see has a mental health component and that's exhausting, um, but better engagement helps at the stage for better ED visit, which helps at the stage for better recovery for the patient, no matter their reason for visiting. And just in general, if you have some of these skills, it does take such pressure off of you. And it kind of makes it just an easier interaction. It doesn't hang around with you for the rest of the day, kind of beating yourself up of how something could have gone differently when you recognize like I did everything that I could. And, you know, we had a good interaction or it turned out better than expected. Um, so something to really put in your wheelhouse and really knowing what are your triggers? You know, we all have those things of just like, as soon as they say it, you just lose, you know, you see red. So is it, you know, somebody pointing a finger in your face? Is it a particular catchphrase that just really sets you off and knowing that so you can say like, okay, I know they just said that. I know that's going to get under my skin. You know, what, what do I need to do to kind of chill out here? And then not being afraid to ask for help. You know, if that means taking some time off, switching some shifts, you know, working to help each other through, this is just an absolutely incredible time. Um, it'll go a long way to the, your own mental health, as well as the mental health of your, of your station. So lots and lots and lots and lots of resources. And I sent the side, slides to Sean and um, I'm gonna have my email up here at the end. Um, so if you want copies of this, you have a question about something, you wanna shoot me an email, um, be happy to answer that. And I see that there's a couple things up here in the chat too. So we'll see if there's anything else, um, any other questions or anything like that. And I'm gonna put my email here in the chat for you as well. So that's all I got. Is there anything else that you guys? What a great talk. Thank you so much. So much information. I, I forgot how much content <laughs> we, we've been able to you cover. It's pretty incredible. Um, <clears throat> while folks uh, chime in on the chat, don't forget, uh, Ashley put um, the link for your CEUs uh, in the chat. And then I'm happy to share the slides. I. You had sent them to me, Deanna, just right? right before. Yeah, as a PDF. Oh, okay. Again, you can just email me directly, and I can send them out to you. Oh my gosh, I can so find that. Um, so I did have one question about how long do you spend with a psych patient? Um, <laughs> and it's true. How long do you have, you know? And so that's where kind of setting that realistic expectation, um, especially like when it's in the middle of a street and you're like, you know, we're tying up traffic here. Um, this is important. Can we at least take it over to the sidewalk? Um, so one of the, the best examples I have of this that comes to mind is I had a, a gentleman who was actually retired special forces. Um, so he was a big dude and knew how to hurt people and he was intoxicated and had a big fight with his significant other and came in and and this is again where like perfect job by the EMS because he had talked them down you know because they had they had police they were going to call on SWAT and everything else but the EMS provider was awesome he really talked them down and, and then when he saw that I was working he was like and you've got my favorite provider you know really just kind of greased the wheels and then the EMS actually stayed to get IV access because he had such good time with them and the patient you know was trying to sort of settle himself down but just was just perseverating and fixating. And I ended up spending a good like hour and a half, like in and out of the room, kept trying to calm him down. Cause I knew what was gonna happen is that if he escalated and we had our security going, he was gonna hurt one of our security guys. Like this was just, it was a trained guy. He was a big guy. 
our security isn't as big as him or as trained as him, frankly. And so we ended up having a conversation. I said, you know, I can see that you just can't calm down. What kind of things? And he said, I just want to fight. I just want to punch something. And I was like, well, shit, this is going to go bad. So I said, what if I give you a mattress? If I let you go to town on a mattress, we'll take the stretcher out of the room and you can just beat the crap out of a mattress. It will that work. And he was so excited. So that's what we did. And so before we did it though, I said, you know, my, my big concern is how are we going to get you back? How are we going to calm you down? Cause once we, you know, take the lid off of this, it's going to be hard. And he's like, I don't know. And I said, what if I gave you some medicine beforehand? If I gave you some medicine, it'll take about 15 minutes to take effect. You can go to town for 15 minutes and then hopefully you'll be in a better place. And he was like, deal. And so I did, I walked in, I gave him out of van. I gave him how doll. I gave him the mattress. We closed the door and we said, go, you know, he destroyed that mattress. <laughs> you know what I mean? Destroyed his knuckles. Um, but he was so appreciative. And then when he woke up the next day, he consented to go to inpatient treatment. Um, and I think that if our interaction had gone differently, he never would have consented to treatment and he wasn't, he didn't have violent intent towards anybody. So there was no reason for us to keep him against his will. But that's one of those where, you know, me spending a significant amount of time was so much better for everybody and including the patient in the end. So you have to know when, when's it really kind of worth it versus the time of being like, I'm sorry, you know, this just isn't working. We've had the same conversation for the last 20 minutes. We're going to have to give you some medicine. We're going to have to go. Um, and that's where you have that debriefing afterwards of figuring out should we have spent more time or less time and what kind of works best for the scene. So I'm going to scroll through here and see if there's any other questions or messages i was able to put um the pdf that you shared i found it. i put it in the chat so in the chat is the pdf for the slides if you click on that you should be able to download that to your device if not um, deanna was kind enough to share her email mm -hmm. it is deanna.bridge d-e-a-n-n-a.bridge at gmail.com yeah, and I saw there's another email there um, that I will be sending the slides to you directly as well. So anything else that you guys can think of? Any other questions or anything come to mind? I know it is a lot of stuff, but it's just kind of a sprinkle of things that I know you guys encounter. It is a lot that we cover for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to see for sure more interaction with the police department and their crisis intervention team are more often on scene, super helpful. Um, having opportunities, though not always in person, but the peer to peer specialist and contacting out for referrals uh, is also a, a good program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's definitely the what we're going to be seeing a lot more of is the mobile crisis. Um, and the idea of like, who does that first call go to? It doesn't always need to be a police call because as soon as police come, they, they bring their own kind of weight to the situation, you know, and, and again, if their only tool is a weapon, that's going to be what they have versus if your only tool is de-escalation, that's what you're going to use. And for you guys is your tool is medication. Um, so how can we kind of, you know, all use those together and then have the right people respond at the right time to keep everybody safe. I'm going to end the present and the recording. Thank you so much. I will share the recording with you as well. Thank you as always for being here.